So hi everyone. Um, so my name is uh, John Gould. I'm an assistant professor here in the School of Physics um, and I'm also a uh, university research fellow from the from the Royal Society. So uh, what I'd like to do in this presentation is just give you a, a very, very brief flavor of the type of research that I do in my group, um, which is called the Thermodynamics and Energetics of Quantum Systems Group. So who are we and what do we do? Well, this is the group pictured here in summer 2019. So what we are is essentially a very diverse bunch of people um, interested in the interface between a theory called quantum mechanics and a theory called thermodynamics. So this was in summer 2019, but of course this, uh, we weren't together in 2020 to take a photograph. So this is now how my research group operates. But luckily enough, we don't do lab work. We're a group that is interested in theoretical physics. So and also numerical modeling. Um, what are we interested in? And I'll just, it's quite technical, um, but let me just briefly uh, tell you about each possible research direction. And then what I'll do is I'll just tell you why I'm motivated to, to be interested in these topics. So the first thing we're interested in is called quantum information theory, okay? So information theory is the basic building block or description of how information is processed. So um, if you think about the 21st century, this is no doubt this has been the age of information processing. We all have very powerful information processors now in our, in our even in our mobile phones. Um, and quantum information processing is the theory of how information can be processed when the information carriers themselves are quantum. So in a phone, for example, you have classical information processing because it's based on classical bits, so electric circuits, etc. But quantum information is basically the theory of how information is processed when you allow uh, the information carriers to obey the laws of quantum mechanics, which is the theory of how uh, matter behaves, you know, at, at, at a small scale. Okay. Um, the other thing the group are interested in is something called statistical physics. So statistical physics is a is a is a staple course that you learn as an undergraduate, um, in I think third year, and it's the theory of how um, sort of macroscopic behavior such as uh, phase transitions, temperature, pressure, etc., emerge from the underlying atomic description. So that's also something that we're very interested in my group, and it ties in very nicely to the undergraduate syllabus. And the other thing that we're interested in is in how quantum systems, so devices made of only a, a handful of atoms, um, so very, very small things, like how heat flows on these devices. That's interesting from both a fundamental perspective and also from the perspective uh, of future technologies which aim at manipulating smaller and smaller devices. Uh, and the other thing is called open quantum systems, um, which is the theory of how quantum systems behave when they're connected to another thing, like a heat bath, etc. But that's technical, don't worry about it. Anyway, so why why am I motivated It's to study these things? So I guess I had to track my mind back. It's not that long ago that I was going to open days myself. And the first motivation ultimately of why you study things um, in physics in particular is, 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 is just out of sheer curiosity. Um, and I guess the big question that I always ask myself um, as a scientist and as someone, you know, right through as a teenager, I was very curious, um, right up through my degree and onwards is, um, you know, really, you know, we learn physics in high school or in secondary school, as we call it in Ireland, um, from the perspective of reductionism, you know, you, you have a set of laws which describe how a particle rolls down an inclined plane or, you know, calculus, etc. But when you put all of these things together and you have many, many parts, you know, you get emergent, a new type of physics that's emerging, which is something that you don't learn about in school, but you start to see it in your undergraduate physics degree. So, like, to give you a very crude example um, is... You know, you, you all have seen at a certain time of year, you see these flocks of birds like starlings and they make these wonderful fluid patterns. So if you want the whole of this sort of picture uh, of birds flying, okay, behaves almost like a, a fluid, okay? Um, and how would you actually understand that behavior if you were just given 
um, you know, a small part of it, like for instance, some very small, you, you zoom in there and you see how these birds interact with each other, they avoid each other, etc. The answer is you actually can't. Um, you could never have guessed the fluid movement if you just had access to a very small part of this. So that's no different from many of the advanced concepts in, in statistical physics. A lot of them by Anderson, who died unfortunately in 2020, was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. I mean, always sort of was motivated by the fact that more is, is really different. So when you have a lot of things coming together, then you get new laws of physics emerging. And that I guess that was always something what I, that I was interested in um, and I started to learn about when I when I did an undergraduate degree. So the, 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 the take home message there is that like, you know, how does different levels of complexity emerge as you increase the system size? So so that's that's the question that I was interested in. The second one is, again, for the fundamental. And it, it's it's motivated by another Nobel Prize winning physicist, Richard Feynman, who was very famous for his for his teaching, actually for his undergraduate lectures. Um, and he's actually seen as being one of the founding fathers of, of nanotechnology, which is the idea that you can use sort of nanoscale objects, you know, to perform useful tasks. Um, and, you know, almost opposite to what Anderson was saying, by looking at very large things, you know, you get new phenomena emerging, such as the fluid behavior of these birds, then, you know, he also was thinking that, well, look, if I could really manipulate atoms you know, just a number of atoms, say, if you think about machines made of several atoms, seven atoms, then you can, you can, you're, you're really dealing with quantum mechanics there. And you could expect that, you know, these machines would function in very different ways than standard machines, which are made of, you know, 10 to the 28 atoms of order. Um, and that's something in my group that we're very interested in. We live in a very nice period of time um, where experimental groups all over the world can now manipulate single atoms and single quantum systems in a way that they can sort of generate mini engines, mini refrigerators um, in various different platforms. And this is something that my group is actively working on. In 2019, we were involved in an experimental collaboration that actually made one of the world's smallest engines from a single atom. So very fascinating. I mean, as of yet, there's not a particular practical application of that, but you know, from the perspective of, of interesting physics, there's no doubt that it's there. And the other thing um, that I'm very interested in is technological, okay? So you might have heard of something called quantum computation. If you have not, that's okay. That's not, that's okay. I mean, basically all of the large computational companies such as IBM, Google, Microsoft, etc., including a whole wealth of um, venture capital now flowing into the SME sector is interested in something called quantum tech. Now, what's quantum tech? Well, the idea is that somehow these technologies, okay, again, they're, the, these are superconducting circuits, etc. Don't worry about the details, but the basic idea is that you can harness the laws of physics, namely quantum mechanics, to do information processing or computations, which are essentially faster than any known current technology. And that's why all of the big companies are investing in that. And actually, it's starting to become an industry in its own right. So watch this space. Um, and this year, I'm actually working on um, making the first MSc in Ireland in the area of quantum information processing, which includes um, an industrial slash academic placement for the students. Um, so let me just finish by, you know, people ask me, what's a quantum computer? And I'll keep it very simple. First of all, ask what's a computation? All computations follow three main steps. You have a preparation step. So think about this abacus here. You, you want to basically make it so that it starts off in this state. Or if you do you know, a computation on a quantum computer, you just want to put the atoms all in the same state. Um, you then encode some problem. So in this case, it's a multiplication problem. Don't worry if you don't, if you don't remember how to use an abacus. It's very simple. Um, and then there's a process whereby logic operations are performed in order for you to get an answer. And that answer is a measurement, okay? So it's a readout of the results. So you can tell from the, the position of these uh, things on the abacus that the answer is 408, okay? And that's exactly the same. Every computation, whether it's an abacus or a calculator in this case, follows the same preparation stage where you have a zero a process where you do some basic bit operation and a measurement. What's going on behind the scenes here is just some electronics that allows 
uh, a logic to be encoded in a classical circuit. And this circuit here, which is behind the scenes in the calculator, follows the laws of, of, of classical physics. A quantum computer is precisely the same. Don't worry about this diagram, but students learn about this in my class in final year. Um, but essentially, the, the logic operations change. You're allowed to do a little bit more with, with, with quantum physics. Um, and you can encode these logic operations on a quantum system. And this is precisely what goes on in the quantum computers, which are basically uh, now functioning from IBM. And actually, I teach about them in this final year course that, I, that, 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 that people take in, in, in Trinity. So what you see here, actually, this huge device is actually the quantum computer is a tiny chip. And all of this thing basically keeps, it's a cryogenic chamber that keeps essentially the, uh, the chip at very, very low temperatures where you can do this computation. So, I mean, that's all I'm really going to talk about. I was going to talk a little bit about some other stuff um, that we were doing on small engines, but don't worry about it. Um, so thanks a lot, and I hope you found it interesting. And I hope that, um, you know, when students start to be exposed to modern theories such as quantum mechanics, which they will in their undergraduate degree, that Trinity's um, degree program will actually also really highlight um, some of the exciting things that are going on in the, in the new quantum tech industry. And I should also mention that my research group every summer takes undergraduate internships, usually in third year because they know a little bit more and they tend to have a very good time in some of those students end up doing PhDs uh, either in my group or in other groups.